Hello everyone, we're here today to talk about Math 120, Section 6.3, which deals with word problems. Now, first, let's talk about how do you solve a word problem? Well, there's a number of steps. First, step one, is read carefully. Read the problem carefully. Reading carefully is the first step to a problem. Step two, the second step of it, word problem solving is determine the knowns and unknowns. What do you know? What don't you know? Determine what are those factors, the knowns and unknowns. Step three, the third step in a word problem is assign a variable to an unknown value. Assign a variable to an unknown value. Pick a variable for one of your unknown values. Number four, express any other unknowns in terms of your variable. If there are still things you don't know after picking a variable, you need to use that same variable for your other unknowns. And we'll see an example of that. But you need to express your other unknowns in terms of your variable. The question itself will help you with this step. This step, I'm going to put an asterisk next to it because a lot of times can be helped by reading the problem carefully, right? By making sure what the words say. Well, after you've expressed the unknown, step five is create an equation to represent the problem. So you create an equation to represent the problem. You create an equation to represent the problem. This also comes from the question itself. A lot of times the words in the question will help you write your equation. Step six, you solve your equation. Solve the equation. I'll give you a hint. If you don't know how to solve the equation you wrote, you probably didn't come up with the correct equation. There should only be equations we recognize and know how to solve. We should have the techniques to solve it. If it looks like it has techniques outside of what we have learned, then you might want to reevaluate step five. But step six is solve the equation. The last step is check the answer. Many times with word problems, your answer should make sense. For example, if a question says, how much water is in a water tower? And, you know, you run through all the steps and variables and equations and you get the answer negative 73. That does not make sense, right? You can't have a negative amount of water inside of something, right? It has to be a positive number. Check the answer. Make sure it makes sense. Reread the question and think about your answer. You check it. A lot of steps, right? Word problems have a lot of steps. So let's do several examples. Let's take a look at our first example. Let's read the whole thing together, and I'll underline as we go. Kirby purchased a copier for $2,300 and a one-year maintenance protection plan that costs two cents per copy. If Kirby spent a total of $26.26 for the year, which included the cost of the copier and the plan, Determine the number of copies he made. So right away, I see an unknown. I have number of copies. That's an unknown, right? The number of copies is an unknown value. Now, I know some things. I know that the total was 2626 for the year. So the total, I actually know that one, $2,626, right? I know the total was $2,626. What else is there in the question? The copier, 
Ah, the copier. Well, the copier cost 2300 right? I know the copier cost 2300 Now, the protection plan. The plan. Do I know the plan? The plan costs two cents per copy made. So I don't know how much the plan cost yet, right? I need to know the number of copies in order to know the plan. And let's see, is there anything else in the question? So I'm going to read again and make sure I got everything. Kirby purchased a copier, got it. Plan, got it. Two cents per copy made. I haven't used this yet, but I know that this is part of this part, right? So maybe I put it in here. 0 0.02 per copy. Spent a total, got that. Copier cost protection plan. Determine. All right, so I have everything from the question written down. I have all the important information uh, sequestered, right? I found the important information. Now I need to pick one of these two things to be my variable. Now let's think about it. If I choose the number of copies, I'm on step four, right? I'm oh, sorry, step three. Doing step four... I could find the cost of the plan, right? I multiply the number of copies times the plan. Similarly, if I chose the plan, I could find the number of copies by dividing by the cost per copy, right? But since I'm looking for the number of copies, I'm going to choose that to be my variable, and I'm going to choose the letter N. N's a good number, or a good letter, for the word number of copies, right? For that idea. You could have used the letter C, X, A, B, C. It doesn't matter what letter you use. I'm going to use the letter N. I get to choose what letter I use. Now, how much does the plan cost if I know N is how many copies I made? Well, I would multiply the copies times the cost, wouldn't I? That's how I could figure out how much the plan costs. If it costs $0.02 cents per copy, I would multiply it by N. So I would get 0.02n for the cost of my plan. So I have assigned a variable, n, and then I expressed the other unknown using that same variable, n. 0.02n is the cost of the plan, right? If I know how many copies I made, I multiply by the cost per copy to get the cost of the plan. Now... I have done steps one through four. I now need to create an equation to represent the problem. Well, the total is 2626, and I know the two things that cost money are the copier and the plan. So if I add the cost of the copier and the cost of the plan, I should get the total, right? If I add the cost of the copier, plus the cost of the plan, I should get the total cost. This is an equation we have the tools to solve. It only has a single variable, right, n, and I need to move the 2300 over first, right? This is a linear equation. We've seen equations like this. Well, to get rid of 2300, I need to subtract it, which means I need to subtract it over here. It cancels on this side, 0.02n, that's what's left here, is equal to 326. Now, to get the n alone, I need to divide, right? I need to divide by the number out front of it. They're being multiplied, opposite of multiplication is division. So I'll divide by 0 0.02, and I'll divide by 0 0.02. Over here, I'll be left with n, which on the right side is 326 divided by 0 0.02, which gives me 1,000, or sorry, 16,300, 16,300 copies. I know the answer is copies because I'm looking for the number of copies, right? I'm trying to answer the question. Kirby must have made 16,300 copies. Let's think about if that makes sense. Let's see. Kirby purchased a copier for $2,300. All right, and a one-year protection plan that costs two cents per copy made. Well, let's see, if I made 16,300 copies and it's two cents per copy, that would have cost me 326 for the protection plan. Ah, which if I add 2,300, does give me the total. Notice I checked my answer. I reread the question and made sure it made sense. So now I know my answer is final. And that actually gives us the hidden eighth step is answer 
the question, which we left separately because it's important to make sure you circle back and make sure you're answering the question. The question says, determine the number of copies he made. I did that. Always make sure you are answering the question. That's why it is separate. That's why it's its own step. It's important to make sure you're answering the question. So that's our first example. Let's take a look at another example. Marcus P. Construction Company purchased 100 acres of land to be split into three parcels of land on which to build houses. Pardon the typo. One parcel of land will be three times as large as the other two. How many acres of land will each parcel contain? So let's see. Marcus P. Construction Co. That's not important, right? That's just random background information. 100 acres? That might be important, right? It's going to be split into three parcels. One parcel will be three times as large as the other two. How many acres will each parcel contain? All right, so I went back in and identified the important information. So what this is saying, if I wanted to draw a quick sketch, here's, you know, some land. And I want to divide it up so that one parcel is three times, you know, let's pretend I drew it perfectly, and these two, you know, if I take this one and triple it, I get this size, right? That's what I want to do. I want to divide it into three chunks where one chunk is thrice as big as the smaller chunks. You know, if I take one of these small chunks, it should give me one-third of this size. Now, I have three unknowns, right? I have three unknowns. I don't know any of the sizes of the land, so I'll write large parcel, small parcel one, and small parcel two. I don't know any of these values, but I know these two have to be the same size. Because one parcel will be three times as large as the other two. That tells me these two must be the same size. Because this one needs to be three times the size of either of these. So I'm going to pick a letter for each of these. It's land, so maybe I'll use L. L for land. If L is the size of one of the small parcels, it's also the size of the other small parcel. They're the same size. The large parcel is the only larger piece, right? How much larger is the large parcel? Three times as large. So expressing this in terms of L would be three times L, because it's three times the size of one of these smaller chunks. So I have my parcels represented by variables. The only part I haven't used is that the land is 100 acres in total, right? It's 100 acres in total. Well, if I add the parcels together, you know, 3L plus L, plus L, it better add up to the whole size of the land, right? If I add my three chunks of land together, I better get the whole thing back. Well, this equation here is actually quite easy to solve from this point. Word problems many times have easy to solve equations that only take a few steps. A lot of times the difficulty is translating the words into the equation because this equation here is 3L plus L plus L while 3L plus L plus L adds up to 5L equals 100 and then to get rid of the 5 I need to divide both sides by 5 right which gives me L equals 20. Now it's 20 acres right so let's check if that makes sense let's see 20 acres. That means the other piece is 20. Let's see. So I've got a 20, a 20, right? I've got two pieces that are 20. How big is 3 times 20? Well, the other piece must be 60 acres big, right? So I checked my answer. I'm checking to see if it makes sense. Do these match the parameters of the question? Let's see. Do they total up to 100, 20, 20, and 60? Yes. Is it three parcels? Yes. Is one of them thrice as large as the others? Yes. So I know I must have done the question right. However, I have not answered the question clearly yet. It wants to know how many acres will each parcel contain. Well, 20 acres, 20 acres 
and 60 acres. 20, 20, and 60 are my answers, right? Now, this is a great example of a question that the words translating that part is much more work intensive, more thought intensive than actually solving the equation. It was two steps. Combine like terms and divide. That was the only two steps to solve the equation once I had it. However, coming up with the equation is the brunt of the work. That is how word problems work. Now, let's take a look at another example. Elmer Fudd is building a sandbox for his pet rabbits. He has 34 feet of wood to use for the perimeter of the sandbox. Perimeter and 34 feet of wood. So perimeter equals 34 feet. What should the dimensions of the sandbox be if he wants the length to be three feet greater than the width? So the length is three feet greater than the width. It might help to draw a picture here, right? I'm building a sandbox. Let's draw a sandbox. Sandboxes look like rectangles, right? And we're talking about perimeter, so we'll draw a rectangle. Let's see. We've got a length and a width, and the perimeter is 34, right? Now, right away, I know something is true about this equation. I know that the perimeter is equal to... Well, you got to add all the sides up, right? What's this side equal to? If I know this side is L, what's the opposite side of a rectangle? It's also L, right? And same thing for this side, it's also W. So let's see, if I want to add these up, I've got, let's see, two L's plus two W's, right? The perimeter of a rectangle is, there's two lengths and two widths you got to add up. So this is a formula I already have. And I know one of the values. I already know 34 feet. There is one part I have not used yet, though, and that is this portion. The length is three feet greater than the width. So the length is supposed to be longer than the width. I know that the length is supposed to be, well, let's see, the width, and I want to make it three feet longer. Well, I better add three to whatever the width was. If I want to make the length longer, I need to increase the width, right? I take the width and add 3 to it. That should give me the length. That's what this last portion says. This portion came from, we're working with a rectangle, and this portion was given to me. I now have something for every variable except one. I know how to work with P. It's 34 equals 2. What is L equal to? Well, L is equal to W plus 3. So I'm going to plug in W plus 3 in those parentheses where L would have gone. Then I have a plus 2 and W. Notice how many variables are in my equation now. Only one, only W. I have rewritten my equation with a single variable in the equation. There might be, you know, W shows up twice, but I don't have more than one variable in the equation. You need to find an equation that has a single variable to work with, right? Because now I can distribute to start solving this equation. That's going to give me 34 equals 2 times w plus 2 times 3 is 6 plus 2w. Two 2w two and 2w two are like terms, so I can combine them to get, I'm going to go over uh, right here, 34 equals, let's see, 4w plus 6. Let's see, how would I solve this equation? 34 equals 4w plus 6. I got to move the 6 first, right? Well, if I subtract 6 from this side, I need to subtract 6 from this side. Pardon, I kind of uh, had to scrunch it here. I wrote a little big. 4w minus 6 cancels out here, so I'm left with 4w equals, let's see, 34 minus 6 is what, 28? So I get 28 equals 4w. Let's see, to get W alone, I got to divide by 4. Divide by 4, I get 7 equals W. So I think the width is 7. Well, if I know the width is 7, let's see, does that make sense? Can a width be 7? Yeah, width 7 feet, right? I would want to put units on it when I go to answer the question. But my answer makes sense, right? So now I want to answer the question. It says, 
what should the dimensions be? What should the dimensions be? Well, let's think about it. It should be 7 feet by... Well, what's the other dimension going to be? We need to use this part again. The 3 feet greater than the width. If the width is 7, what's 3 feet bigger than that? 10 feet. So my answer is 7 feet by 10 feet. So this should be 10, this should be 10, this should be 7, and this should be 7. 7, 10, 10, and 7, right? Does that have a perimeter of 34? Let's see, 17, uh, 24, 34. Yep, if I add up all the sides, I get back the perimeter I wanted. These must be the dimensions of Elmer's sandbox. 7 feet by 10 feet. So I've solved the question. Notice this was a little bit different. I had to use my knowledge of rectangles to help me with my equation. But it still led to the same answer, right? Or the same strategy where I have to start using my equation solving techniques. Now, example number four. Samantha is selling her homemade jewelry at a craft show. That's not relevant to the question, right? That's, there's no mathematical information. That's just the backstory. Determine the cost of a necklace before tax. Cost before tax if the total cost, including an 8% sales tax, is $35.56. So let's see what I have. I have cost before tax. That is something I'm looking for, right? I have total cost. I have tax rate, let's see, total cost, tax rate, what else do I have? Well, that's the, that's the uh, knowns and unknowns from the question, right? So the cost before tax, that's what I'm looking for. Maybe I'll use C for cost. I'm going to assign that variable right away because I know it's what I'm already looking for. It's probably a good idea that that's going to be my variable, right? The total cost was 35.56 and the tax rate was 0 0.08 wait it said 8% why did I put 0 0.08 well what is 8 divided by 100 remember whenever you see percentages you gotta turn them into decimals before you can use them in equations so I've got some things going on now, before I write my equation, I should think carefully about what's going on. How do I determine the cost of an item in the real world? Well, you got to take the original cost plus the tax gives the total. Right? That's how equations for price work, right? You take the original cost, you add the tax on, and you get the total. The original cost is equal to C, right? That was the cost before tax. That's the original cost. Plus, how do you find the tax on something? Well, you multiply these two together. You multiply the tax rate times what the object costs. So if I take 0 0.08 and multiply it by the cost... I am going to get the tax. So the original cost was C. The tax is 0 0.08 times C. And the total is 35.56. Now, I have the original cost plus the tax equals the total. I'm now ready to solve this. What number's hiding out front of this C is 1. 1 plus 0 0.08 is 1 0.08 C equals 35.56. So I combine my like terms and then I divide. 1.08 divide by 1.08 gives me cost equals, well let's check. 35.56 divided by 1.08 equals, I get some decimal. Where do I want to round this to? Where do I want to round this value off? I get 32.925, let's see, 32.925925. How much is money rounded to? 
two decimal places, right? I want to round to right here. Money is always two decimal places, right? So the cost is equal to 32.93, right? The 5 tells me to give the 2 a shove. So 32.93 dollars is how much the necklace cost. Notice I had to walk through the individual steps. Once again, was solving the actual equation, once we got to this point, it was two steps. Combine like terms, divide. Just like in this one. Similar, this one, we distributed, we combine like terms, subtract, divide. There's usually not a ton of steps in solving equations. In our first example, we shifted the constant over and then divided, two steps. The brunt of the work in word problems is identifying the equation from the words themselves. Notice how we walk through carefully. We delineated all the knowns and unknowns. That is a habit you want to be in. You want to be able to create these equations because it will help us to find our answers, right? Once you have the equation, we're in familiar territory. We're solving equations. We are no longer in translating words to symbols, right? Now, we're going to talk a little bit about ratios and proportions. A ratio is a... Um, Fractional relationship, fractional relationship between, I abbreviated between, two values. A great example of a ratio is cars, miles per gallon. You're relating the miles you can drive to the gallons of gas you have. You are creating a ratio, miles per gallon. There's also another ratio with cars, miles per per hour. You're relating the number of miles you can travel in an hour of time. We see these ratios. In cooking, you might be making a recipe that says you want to keep the liquids and the solids in a two to one ratio. So you want two parts liquid for every one part solid. You have a ratio, right? It's a relationship between two values. A proportion is an equation between two ratios, between two ratios. That is a proportion. It's an equation that two ratios are equal. They're in proportion to each other, right? That's synonymous with what it means in English, right? A proportion is an equation between two ratios. Two things are in proportion to each other. Cross multiplication is a technique for solving Proportions. Proportions. And what this says is if I have A over B is equal to C over D, then that tells me I know that I can cross multiply. This tells me that A times D is equal to B times C. I multiply across. That is cross multiplication. So let's take a look here. X plus 2 over 5 is equal to X plus 5 over 8. I have two ratios equal. This is a proportion. I want to cross multiply. X plus 2 times 8. Well, X plus 2 times 8, I need to be careful... And make sure I put parentheses around the x plus 2. It's its own object, right? And I want to multiply that by 8. Equals 5 times x plus 5. Same thing. 5 times the x plus 5 is its own chunk. So I want to keep it as its own group. Now, to solve this equation, I need to distribute. Here, I'll distribute and get 5x plus 25, right? Over here, it might look funky, but I'm going to distribute also, right? This multiplication works forwards and backwards, right? If you can distribute, you know, leftwards, you know, from the left, you can distribute from this side too. Multiplication works both ways, right? 8 times x, 8x, plus 2 times 8, 16. 
So I now have an equation that looks more familiar. I need to get all the x terms on one side. Well, I'll subtract 5x from this side, which means I got to do the same to this side. 8 minus 5 is 3x plus 16 equals 25. Let's see, I got to get the 16 on the other side, so I'll subtract 16 gives me, let's see, 3x equals 25 minus 16, looks to be about 9. Now my last step, I got to divide. Divide by 3 gives me x equals 3 as my answer. Let's see, 3 plus 2, that's 5 over 5. 3 plus 5, that's 8 over 8. Looks like both sides, it does work out to be 5 over 5 is 1. 8 over 8 is 1, so if I real quick plug back in mentally, I can see that this answer is correct. I can check that it's correct, right? So, we have a answer. We can cross multiply. Now, we'll also be using proportions in word problems. Now, these ones are actually fewer steps. Word problems involving proportions are fewer steps. The first step is read and recognize the presence of proportions. When reading the problem, you want to recognize that there's proportions and ratios. Ratios, right? You want to make sure there's ratios in the problem. You want to recognize there's ratios in the problem. Because if there's not proportions, you can't use proportion techniques on it. Step two identify the known ratio. One of the ratios will be known, and we will identify which is the known ratio. Step three is set up the proportion equation by matching the known ratio with the unknown ratio. So we set up the proportion equation by matching. I'm going to underline the word matching because that will be important. We'll see what I mean with matching when we talk about it. But you want to make sure that the proportions, the ratios match in the proportion equation. So we set up the proportion equation by matching the known ratio with the unknown. Oops, I forgot the N. Unknown ratio. Step four is solve. Step four, we solve the equation, right? Usually by cross-multiplying. If it's proportions, we're probably going to cross-multiply. Step five is check. You want to check your answer. And then step six, you want to make sure you answer the question. Remember, that's an important step, and it's its own important step. Always remember, you want to make sure you're answering the question. So, these are our steps. Let's take a look at some of these examples. It says, the cost for water in the city of Saranac Lake is $2.14 per 1,000 gallons of water used. I see a ratio right there. It's telling me dollars to gallons. It's telling me a ratio that gives me the cost of water. And then it says, what is the water bill if 25,000 gallons of water are used? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write my known ratio. Oops. I'm going to write my known ratio right here. I know $2.14 works for every 1,000 gallons. $2.14 per 1,000 gallons. Notice I put the units because I am going to want to set up the unknown ratio. And the dollars will go in the top and the gallons will go in the bottom. It has to be this way. They have to match. Remember I said matching was key. So make sure we're matching the units. Dollars to dollars, gallons to gallons. Now, did I know the dollars? No, it says, what is the bill? I'm looking for dollars, right? So I'll make that X. I do not know that value, right? That's an unknown value. I do know the gallons, though, right? 25,000. 
to solve this problem, I now need to cross multiply. I have set up my proportion. Now I cross multiply. I get 1000 X, right? 1000 times X equals, let's see, $2.14, 214 times 25,000 gives me 53,500. 53,500 when I cross multiply 214 times 25K, right? Now, to get the X alone, I got to divide. Divide by 1,000. Divide by 1,000. Let's see. Maybe we're not good with dividing by 1,000. Gives me 53 and a half. So X equals 53.5. What's the units on X? Well, it's dollars, right? So my answer would be dollars. The proportion tells me X was measured in dollars. And I have 53 and 0.5, we usually put a zero with money, right? Because it's always two decimal places, 5350. So the water bill would be $53 and 50 cents, right? Notice I set up the proportion. Let's look at another example. Insulin comes in vials labeled with the number of insulin units per cubic centimeter. So I see right away I've got the word per. I'm going to start thinking there might be ratios. I'm already thinking there might be ratios. I haven't been given a ratio, but I have that idea in mind already. An insulin vial labeled U40, that's just background information, has 40 insulin units per cc of fluid. Ah, that is a ratio. I'm immediately going to write that ratio down because I see it. 40 insulin units, right? That's how it's measured, per Let's see, per cc of fluid. Well, that'd be per one cc, cubic centimeter. If it says per cc of fluid, think about miles per gallon is how many miles per one gallon of gas, right? Miles per hour is how many miles per one hour of gas. 40 insulin units per cc of fluid would be 40 units per one cc, right? Now, Zachary's insulin dosage is 30 insulin units. How many cubic centimeters, how much cc are needed for Zach's dosage? Well, I'm going to set up my unknown, and I'm going to put insulin units and cubic centimeters. I match the units. What do I know about my unknown? I know Zachary's insulin units. I don't know his cubic centimeters, right? Insulin units would be 30. Cubic centimeters would be X because I don't know it. Now, I'm ready to cross multiply. I can cross multiply. 40 times x gives me 40x equals 1 times 30 gives me 30. Now, to get x alone, I need to divide both sides by 40, which tells me x is equal to 30 divided by 40, reduces to 3 over 4, or because it's a real world problem, I might want the decimal. If a question asks for decimal format, just divide it out, right? 30 divided by 40 gives me the decimal. And I know the units are cc. So I have my answer. 30, or sorry, 0.75 cubic centimeters. Notice I just had to set up the proportion, cross multiply, and that gave me the answer. Now, let's look at our last example. Garfield is cooking lasagna. His recipe makes six servings of lasagna and uses 16 ounces of noodles. I see a ratio right there. Servings to ounces of noodles. All right, cool. If the recipe were to be made for 15 servings, how many ounces of noodles are needed? Part A. Part B. How many servings of lasagna can be made with 24 ounces? All right. So I got a part A and a part B. But first, let's focus on part A. Let's see. I have a known ratio. Six servings to 16 ounces of noodles, right? It's servings to ounces. That is the known ratio. Well, if I'm doing proportion problems, if I'm trying to use the unknown ratio, I need servings to ounces again, right? Let's see. The rest. So for part A, I know the servings and I want to find the ounces. Well, 15 servings x ounces. Let's see. It looks like I can uh, cross multiply, right? I can cross multiply here. 6 times x 
equals, let's see, 16 times 15 would be 250 maybe. Let's check it to be sure, 16, or sorry, 240. 240, yes. So 6x equals 240. Divide both sides by 6 gives me x equals, let's see, 240 divided by 6 gives me 40. 40 ounces of noodles for part A. Maybe I label it with an A, right? Oops, sorry. 6x, I got to divide by 6. Sorry, I was a little off camera there. 240 divided by 6 gives me 40. That's part A, right? 40 ounces of noodles. So I've done part A. Part B, how many servings can be made with 24 ounces? I got to do the same thing, right? I still know 6 to 16 is my servings to ounces, right? Maybe I put a little S and a little O here so I remember which unit is which. Well, on the other side, I'm going to put a little S and a little O. This time I know ounces, right? I don't know the servings. So this time, maybe I use the letter Y. I can't use the letter X, right? I've already used the letter X for part A. I'll use the letter Y. Good letter to use after X, right? And ounces, I know, is 24. Well, cross multiplying, I get 16 times Y equals, let's see, 6 times 24 would be 144, I believe. 6 times 24, 144, yes. Divide both sides by 16 will give me Y equals, I believe that works out to be 9. Divide by 16, yes, it is 9. So I get y equals 9 servings. y is servings. Servings. Serving. Or part B, right? So I label my answers A and B, right? 40 ounces for part A if I want to make 15 servings. And 9 servings for part B. Does this make sense? Let's think about it. Originally, I can make six servings for 16 ounces. If I want to make no more servings, I need more noodles, right? Let's see. That makes sense. Now, let's see. If I want to use more noodles, I should get more servings. And yes, I did. You can check that your answers make sense. If you're, you know, you're increasing one value of proportion, you can understand how it should affect the other side of the proportion, right? If I want to make six servings and it takes 16 ounces, I want to up the servings. I'm going to need to up how much noodles I'm using, right? And I did. If I'm going to make, use extra noodles, I'm going to get extra servings. And I did. So make sure your answers are making sense. Always double check them. Always reread the question and make sure your numbers are actually making sense. And that is the conclusion of section 6.3. Thanks for stopping in, and I will see you next time.